And so what I want to talk about today is some piece of work I obtained in collaboration with Mark Burger. And it's roughly one year old. And so I want to tell you something that we proved about ultra limits of maximal representations. But I actually want to mostly give you the con some context in which this result take place. And namely, I want to start telling you what are, for me, maximal representations. And why I do consider that interesting object to be studied. So, and I will motivate that by telling you some geometric properties of those. maximal representation, and, and then after, only after that, I'll move to ultra limits. And so actions on asymptotic cones. So that I can describe you a result about elements acting with fixed points. So, but as I said, I, I hope I will try slow for known experts, and I'm sorry for experts who know all this stuff already and maybe have even heard me talking about this already. But, but please ask me things if you don't understand. So what are maximal representations? So maximal representations are, for me, families of homomorphisms, rho from gamma to g, where I have to tell you what's gamma and what's g for me. Where gamma is a discrete group. That's the fundamental group of a surface. That's or a hyperbolic surface that's either compact or finite volume. Actually, I only care that gamma, at being a marked fundamental group of a surface, I will endow this surface with a hyperbolic metric so that I can talk about geodesic, but that's not needed at all. I mean, it's just to make st some statement easy to, to say. And G is going to be the Lie group, SP, to an R, which is the matrix group preserving a symplectic form, namely matrices GL and uh, GL to an R, such that G transpose time the matrix zero identity minus identity zero G is equal zero is equal to this, this matrix J. Okay? So, of course, I could do this in a more general term, but I want to be concrete and, I mean, it's, it's an easy linear algebra object, right? I mean, this group of matrices. So, I have those homomorphisms. I will restrict to some class of nice homomorphisms of surface group in this, I mean, which will give me subgroups of this Lie group that are isomorphic to either fundamental group of a surface or free groups, okay? And I want to think of those, at least for the beginning, as actions of this group here onto the symmetric space for this Lie group. of gamma. So what is this guy here? So symmetric spaces are examples of cat zero spaces. And I like the symmetric space for the symplectic group because it's really a high, I mean, it's a lot of a high rank generalization of the upper half plane. So the symmetric space, so sp to an r is a simple Lie group with which has maximal compact subgroups 
that are, it's non-compact, and that's maximal compact subgroups that are all homomorphic to UN. And the quotient space, the symmetric space, can be realized as pairs X plus IY of matrices, such that X is a symmetric matrix, and by N matrix, and Y is a positive definite, and by N matrix. So you clearly see the analogy of this with the upper half plane model. In the upper half plane, those will be and n would be one, and indeed sp2 is sl2, and this is really the same model. This is a cat zero space, and this is a model inside sim symmetric n by n matrices with complex coefficients that I think of a, in a fine chart of the Lagrangians of c to the 2n where Lagrangians are maximal isotropic subspaces for this symplectic form I wrote here, okay? So this is really, you should really think of this as the upper half plane, where both base, both the horizontal and the vertical direction are symmetric matrices. But actually the analogy goes much further, so I want to tell you why this is really like this, the upper half plane. So this is a complex manifold, And indeed, in this business, unless, I mean, I know that Jeff is not going to be happy, but the picture is going to be drawn in the upper half plane model or the Poincare model, but not straight line. I mean, lines are not straight. And, but moreover, it has, I mean, this symmetric space is a nice property that, so it's a cat zero space, so it's a geodesic metric space. But in a symmetric space, not all geodesic are made the same. I mean, that's the main difference between higher rank symmetric spaces and rank one spaces. So, but however, if you take a geodesic, a specific geodesic that's singular in some specific direction, then its parallel set is a half dimensional totally geodesic space, subspace. That they can use to play the role of geodesics in the, up in, in, in the standard hyperbolic setting. So these are going to be parallel set of some singular geodesic, which has, and, and they have the property that have an intersection pattern. So maybe I should with that is really similar to the one of geodesic. And indeed, one way you can picture this, so an example of those is the set of I, Y, such that Y is symmetric positive definite. That would be what you would draw here, right? That's an example of a geodesic. And moreover, you have also the, the, the generalization of the, semi, the orthogonal semicircle that are obtained by translating this guy. Okay? So this is a feature that it's, an, it's a higher rank analog of what happens in the hyperbolic plane. And another important feature of this symmetric space is that on the boundary, so there is some boundary that is endowed with a partial cyclic order. As S1, right? That's the, the, the I rank generalization of S1. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So now, this is a, another difference of higher rank symmetric spaces as opposed to rank one spaces is that 
the boundary is not as easy as in rank one. In rank one, you have the visual boundary that's, a well, that's an easy, well-defined object that coincides to the boundary to, to an homogeneous space for this group here. And it's also the topological boundary in all models you draw. You draw. Whereas in higher rank, it's more complicated. The, both the visual boundary and the topological boundary stratify in different homogeneous spaces. But both in the visual boundary and the topological boundary of this realization, you see a specific closed G orbit. So those are the Lagrangians of R2N. So, so the isotropic subspaces. such that the symplectic pairing restricted to W is identically, is identically zero, is a closed G, where G is uh, SP to an R orbit, which lives both in the boundary, so in the topological boundary of this realization of the symmetric space inside these Lagrangians and as a stratum and in the, the visual boundary. As a cut zero space, right? But, so of course you should notice that the Lagrangians are an n times n plus one half dimensional subspace I mean, as a real manifold, whereas this is twice that dimension. So it's not going to be the topological boundary in this realization. However, it's useful because we have this property that G acts on pairs of Lagrangians transitively where here when I write two I mean transverse sub subspace so it's an open subset of the of the pairs of points and has only n plus one orbits in the Lagrangians on R to the two n to the third power. I mean, three poles of transverse Lagrangians. So, in the circle, you have that SL two R acts transitively on pairs of points, and you have the orientation of three poles of points that is complete invariant of the act for the action on three poles. And in this case, you have what is called the Maslow co-cycle. classify, I mean, determines this n plus one orbit. And allows us to talk about positively oriented orbits. Other question on this? So I want to look at actions of fundamental group on surfaces on symmetric on this specific kind of symmetric space. It's actually slightly more general than this, but it's going to be enough for today. And I have three properties of these symmetric spaces that are the same as I see in SL2 and allow me to redraw many picture that I see for SL2 in this higher rank setting. Namely, the fact that it's a complex manifold that I have this half dimensional subspace and have this partial cyclic ordering on triples, okay? And now this is gonna allow me to tell you what maximal representations are. And I'll do that by slightly cheating in the interest of time. Namely, I give you a definition slash theorem 
This is due to burger, yozzi, laburi, and beanard, which tells me that an homomorphism rho from gamma into sp to an r is maximal, or is a maximal representation if there exists a boundary map, a map phi from the boundary S1 into the Lagrangians, which is rho equivariant and monotone. Where monotone means sending maximal triples positively oriented triples to maximal triples to positively oriented. Okay? So here I'm saying that it's a definition theorem because actually you can define in a more conceptual way maximal representation using cohomology and or bounded cohomology. But I want to sweep that over under the rag and just take this that, that would be a theorem proven using that fact to, as a definition for today because that's what's gonna, sufficient, what's gonna be sufficient for the rest. Huh? Right, that's what I said. I mean, at, at some point I said that if it, if it was a free group, I was fixing a finite volume hyperbolization so that I then, it's, it's a quotient of the topological boundary. I mean, you can also do that by taking the actual boundary, but then it's not completely true here that it needs to send every positively oriented triple to a positively oriented triple. So it just, I mean, it's, it's all stuff that you can do, but it takes some more, it's more annoying to write things correctly. Yeah. And indeed, let, that's the first example, right? So if n is equal to 1, then maximal representation. So if n is equal to 1, sp2 is SL2. And maximal representations are precisely in this setting are exactly lifts of holonomies of hyperbolizations. What I mean by this is that, so if I fix an hyperbolic metric on my surface, then I can identify the universal cover of my surface with H2 and this is going to give me a map from, I mean, given two different hyperbolization at that point, I will have a quasi-isometry between, H, between H2 to H2 that extends to a positive boundary map, right? So in, in particular, now I didn't want to quotient by the PSL2R action, by the SL2R action, but this identifies with the Teichmuller space essentially. I mean, if you mod out conjugation. Okay, so but there are two other important examples. So two direct sum of maximal representations are maximal. And this is easier to see with the homological characterization of maximal representations, but also you can build up this boundary. I mean, if you have boundary maps, you can build them together to get a boundary map on a bigger space. And by this I mean that if I have 
a number of maximal representation in different symplectic group. I can take the direct sum of those symplectic, the orthogonal symplectic sum of those vector spaces and put them in blocks to get the maximal representation in the bigger group. And the other example is that the image, so if I denote by Yota from SL2R to SP to an R, the irreducible representations, then Yota composed with rho is maximal for any hyperbolization rho. And this gives me a lot of examples of maximal representations in various symplectic groups. Okay? And those are going to be, in a sense, function local in a sense, a function locus or generalization of function locus because it's going to be much smaller than the ambient group. So, any questions on this? So, now, okay, so that means, brings me to part two in, in which I want to tell you why these are interesting object and tell you some nice geometric properties of those objects that make them interesting to be studied for me. So the first one is, uh, again, due to the same paper where the definition appeared, so again, for sympathetic group Burger, Yossi, Laburi, Wiener, or with or without Laburi, depending on whether you want to do the open or closed surfaces, which give me many very important features of this representations. And the first one that's very stunning is that it's a union of components. So this is, but more, those are all discrete and injective. Homomorphisms. And say in the case of uh, Closed surfaces, those are Anosov representations. And in particular, so, and if you don't know what Anosov representations are, probably maybe Andres will talk about it at some point during this week or someone. But <laughs> anyway, uh, this, this implies that they are QI embeddings. And probably you know what that is, and that makes them interesting. And in a sense, all these properties together make them very interesting because, I mean, it's, it's a very unusual phenomenon that whole representation in a component are very well behaved. Normally, you would expect that you're able to deform a representation to, some, to, to get something that's non-geometric. But in this setting, it's some, the positivity forces nice behavior throughout the whole component. Okay? But now I want to tell you a more geometric feature of this representation that makes, me, that makes them kind of interesting. And it's one of the motivations why this fits into the higher tech mirror theory setting, which is the fact that this representation satisfies color lemma. So they're really remembering a lot of the geometry of the hyperbolic, of the Teichmann space. And let me start recalling you what color lemma means, because it's a very useful fact in hyperbolic 
very old and very useful fact in hyperbolic geometry that maybe not all students know at this point. So I fix an hyperbolic metric on my favorite surface. That's the surface of genus G. And I assume that there is a geodesic gamma in my, in my hyperbolization, which is very short. Then Linda Keen proved that any, so that this geodesic gamma has a very wide embedded color. Namely, that it has a, so then gamma has a long embedded color of length roughly log of one over L of gamma. So if gamma is, la is long L of gamma, and L of gamma goes to zero, then this goes to infinity logarithmic in, in, in that number. And in particular, if I have gamma and eta geodesics on a surface with intersecting axes, then if I take e to the length of gamma minus 1 times e to the length of eta minus 1, this is bigger or equal than 1. And you see that this is kind of correct, right? Because if L of gamma is very close, to, at least when gamma is very close to 0, this is roughly L of gamma. So this tells me that L of eta is bigger or equal than the log of 1 over L of gamma. Uh, this is roughly the same picture. And this is very useful in many places in hyperbolic geometry. And we proved that the same is true for maximal representations. Namely, that if I have rho from gamma in sp to an r maximal, and I take gamma and eta elements of gamma that I think is closed geodesic on my surface with intersecting axes. Then we get that E to the L of rho of gamma divided by root n minus 1 times E to the L of rho of eta divided by root n minus 1 is bigger or equal than 1. Okay. And this is kind of a surprising, I mean, this is kind of a surprising fact because in, for maximal representation, these isometries need not even be hyperbolic, meaning that they do not necessarily have a mean set. But even that if the mean set exists, this might be very far away. So there are examples of maximal representation for which of uh, rho of gamma and rho of eta can be far away in the symmetric space. Namely that now, so in uh, hyperbolic geometry, the dimension was so low that crossing axes means that the mean set need to intersect. And you can apply local analysis there and deduce this from Margulis' lemma kind of argument. Whereas here I can produce for you examples of maximal representation so that these guys have mean sets or even sets in which the translation is close to optimal that are very far away. But nevertheless, this representation remembers a lot of the, geomet of the geometry of hyperbolic, of, of, of my hyperbolic, of hyperbolizations. And also I should definitely say that this was due to, I mean, a more refined version was due to Gison Li and Tangren Zhang for representation. Yes, 
which in this case is things that can be deformed from this guy here. Okay, right? I said that maximal representation are union of components, so I start with one of those, I deform them, I still get the maximal representations. For all those, they prove a, a, a better estimate for this, because this is not achieved, not even, I mean, this is a not as, I mean, this is a corollary, but it's not sharp, as opposed to the color lemma in hyperbolic setting, and their version here is slightly better than ours. And also, this is really a non-general phenomenon because, for example, it's not true. I mean, nothing similar. For other classes of nicely behaved uh, representation of surface groups, like the quasi-function space. But that was something that was pointed out by Tangren and Gison. Okay. Any question up to this point? But I hope that this persuaded you that those are interesting objects because of some unexpected behavior, right? I mean, they are unexpectedly nice for many reasons. So we, we should want to understand what really forces this and how, I mean, understand more of the geometry of these objects. And that's what we're gonna do by looking at ultra limits. The idea of ultra limits is a very old idea that if you want to understand phenomena or large scale phenomena of objects, you should rescale to blow this phenomenon so that they become more, more uh, they become easier to, to see. Let me tell, tell you what. what I mean by that and what I do, what I mean in general. So I take rho k from gamma to g in unbounded sequence of representations. So if I take a bounded sequence that converges in the representation variety and since maximal representation from components, I will still get the maximal representation. So I want to go to infinity and see what, what new I can discover there. But if I go to infinity, I lose information of my representation. So if I want to see something in the limit, I'll need to rescale. And what is a good re way to rescale? I fix x0 in my symmetric, remember that I want to think of those as actions on the symmetric space. And I fix a base point x0, and I look how much Say that gamma is generated by A1, B1, and maybe C1 with some relations, I mean, product. I'm the product of CI. And I look at my, how much my generating set translate my base point. And I define the displacement at this base point to be the, the other the sum of those translations. So I define lambda k to be the sum of the distance of x0 and s times x0 squared, say. Where s in s is, so let's say that this is s, my generating set. I mean, I could, I could choose to be standard, but not necessarily, right? And if I want to see something in the limit, I'll need to rescale at least by this, by this constant. Right? Because I want that all my generators move my base point somewhere where I can see it. Right? So I rescale the metric by lambda k at each factor, and I get let's let's fix omega and ultra filter. Let me comment a bit on it later. So I get an action to 
rho omega, an isometric action, rho omega from gamma into the isometry of the asymptotic cone of x with the distance rescaled by lambda k. Right? So this is a metric. So an ultra filter, I mean, I'm not going to get into detail of what an ultra filter is, but it's something that is provided by logic and allows me to take limits of any sequence in a coherent way, respecting all kinds of nice properties of my objects. And it's not so hard to say that since I rescaled it so that all my generators will still act on this limit, I will get an isometric action from the, from the, the sequence of isometries. So and C omega is actually the limit of this metric space. So it's a set of sequences in X to the N, sequences of points in my symmetric space such that the distance yk x0 divided by lambda k is smaller than infinity. But if I want that the distance induces a distance on this space, I need to quotient. So I, I want to define the distance between two sequences as the limit of the distances. But if I want to do that, I need to get the metric quotient. So this is going to be modeled out by the equivalence relation given by yk is equivalent to zk if the limit of the distance of yk and zk divided by lambda k goes to zero. So this is a way of looking at my symmetric space from far away, from farther and farther away. And the idea should, that should be that this object I get at the end is, in a sense, more combinatorial and easier to study than the symmetric space I was starting with. So it's mo it should be easier to spot properties in that context than it was in the symmetric space. So idea, that was the philosopher I was telling you before, that some I mean aspects of C omega of X are more combinatorial and easier to study than in the symmetric space. Okay? And so what it, it's well known what this asymptotic cone is. And it was proven by Klein and Leib that C omega is an affine building What, what do I mean by this? I'm not going to define you what is an affine building, but I I'm going to give you an example that is very relevant to this picture. So the first example that's very relevant to this picture is what happens in SL2R. That's what should be the motivating example. So for SL2R, I would get T, that's the universal R3, which is an object that is a zero hyperbolic space, so that that for which, for that, such that for each triple of point, they determine a tripod. But it's an R3 means that instead of the simplicial tree we're more used to, I'm allowing branching in all possible points. And moreover, at each point, I will have count, uncountably many different directions swapping out. Right? So that's, that's the first example to keep in mind, which is complicated because it's branching in every point in infinitely many directions. But still, is a, I mean, whenever you look at finitely many points, 
it's very easy to understand what's going on. I mean, much easier than in the hyperbolic plane. And another very important example is that one should think of is the product of n of those. T to the n is equal to, so the, the Cartesian product of n are trees, uh, n universal are trees. It's not true that this asymptotic cone we're looking at is that object, but it is true that it's covered by families of subsymmetric spaces that are, that are of this form. So in, in this symmetric space, I have more, so in, in an R3, I have branching at points. If I take a product of R3, this is covered by Rn, say R2, and I have branching in the horizontal and vertical direction that corresponds to the factors. Whereas here, I'm also allowing branching on diagonals for, for this space here. But again, if you, if you want to understand configuration of up to four points, the boundary, then you can relate your picture in this object here. So you can find the subsymmetric space of that form in which everything happens. So I was telling that these are these that are easier to study than symmetric spaces. Why is this true? It's because, well, for example, we dropped the dimension a lot. So the symmetric space was an open subset of symmetric n by n matrices that has dimension n times n plus 1, whereas this is covered by Rn's. So, so it has dimension n as opposed to n times n plus 1. But moreover, all the negative curvature phenomenon has been split apart from the flat phenomenon, right? So the, the feature of higher rank symmetric spaces is that you have some flat subspaces and some directions in which you have negative curvature. And here I'm concentrating the negative curvature in the branching and keeping the flat part that way. So. But moreover, we created sets of, mi of minimal displacement. So for example, elements, I mean isometries of our buildings have zero translation length. If and only if they have an actual fixed point. And this makes the study of those objects much easier. I mean, you know, in hyperbolic geometry, you have parabolics, for example, that act with zero translation length, but have no actual, I, mean, I have a fixed point at infinity, but not in the space. Whereas here, all fixed points are being moved within the space. So let me get to the theorem that we proved for this action. So the context, the context is I have an unbounded sequence of maximal representation. I get an action on this, on this R building, and I want to study the elements of my group that can act on this space with a fixed point. The theorem.
So I get rho omega from gamma into the isometries of the asymptotic cone. A limit. of maximal representations. Then we find the topological decomposition of the surface uh, along simple closed curves. So let me, let me draw a picture to make this more concrete. So at my surface, that was important in the very first definition of my maximal representation, and we can find the canonical set of curves, CIs, uh, that are simple and pairwise disjoint. the property that each of those rho of ci has so rho of ci that I think of a conjugacy class of isometries of elements in my fundamental group as a fixed point in uh, at least one fixed point in c omega. Moreover, for each gamma crossing the composition, namely for each other element gamma that intersects non-trivial at least one of the elements in my decomposition, rho of gamma has positive translation length. And moreover, for each complementary piece sigma v, there is a dichotomy So either each, I mean, the translation length of rho omega of gamma is positive for each gamma contained in sigma v. So I take a complementary piece like this one whole torus, and either all curves inside that piece have positive translation length, or there exists a point B, BV, in the asymptotic cone, which is fixed by rho omega of P1, pi 1 of sigma v with respect to any base point. And what I mean by this is that I have a conjugacy class of subgroups of gamma that are conjugate to the fundamental group of my piece. And each such a conjugacy class will have a fixed point somewhere. But these fixed points are going to be distinct. And actually, we can use these fixed points some, in some cases to build an invariant convex subtree. But first, maybe I should ask if it's clear if it was too fast. Hmm? C could be empty. C could be empty, and in that case, could either, they could either all have positive length, or they can, there, there could be a global fixed point. Because, of, because when I'm doing this procedure, I'm fixing a base point. I mean, I, I was looking at representation not up to conjugation, but fixed representations. So I had the fixed choice of the base point, 
that could be the very wrong one and could get more and more wrong within the sequence. And in that case, that would be a global fixed point for that action. Yeah, we can prove that that's the only case. And actually, we're saying that we can use these fixed points to produce invariant subtrees in some cases. So that's the second part that if all complementary subsurfaces are short, I mean, correspond to short geodesic. Then, the way I want to say this is that then the collection of fixed points uh, extends to a quasi isometric embedding of the Well, to the decomposition CI, given by, given, by, given by the decomposition given by my collection of curve curves, of uh, cutting curves, into C, into the asymptotic cone. What I mean by this, I mean that I add my collection of curves, I lift them up to the universal cover, and I have the dual tree to this decomposition of H2. Each point corresponds to a conjugacy class conjugated it to one subsurface. And so I can map it into the, the building with the, that, that corresponding fixed point, canonical fixed point. And this extends to a map to this tree, which is a quasi isometric embedding, and moreover, is a geodesic. with respect to a suitable Finsler metric. In general, it's not going to be geodesic. It's going to be a quasi symmetric embedding that's not going to be geodesic with respect to the metric on this object induced by the Riemannian metric on the symmetric space. But if I decided to endow this my symmetric space with the Finsler metric, then that would be geodesic with a specific Finsler metric that I'm not going to define here unless you ask for it. Uh -huh. Are there questions on this? All of them are going to be realized. I mean, for any topological data, I mean, you choose, and that is kind of, I mean, you can do it easily by cheating. I mean, already in the tech mirror space, you realize all of this. And you can, I mean, you can also get the risky dense representation that realizes all the composition by getting a sequence by twisting with suitable elements in the mapping class group. Now I have some choice to be made in this, my, in my five. Okay, but let me get some corollaries for maximal representation themselves that goes into my idea that looking at this object make it it's easier than looking before, and I can deduce information on my on the object I was interested in at the beginning. So something that is kind of I find interesting is that 
I take S in gamma, a connected generating set. And by this I mean that S is a generating set for my group, and the union of the axes project to a connected graph in my surface. Then, if each S in S as a fixed point somewhere in the building, then the limiting action has a global fixed point. And another, and this is because if I have a non-trivial decomposition, then I have at least one long element, and at least one of the elements in my generating set is going to cross at least one of the curves in my decomposition. But the, the important feature is that, in general, when isometries of these asymptotic cones are going to have fixed points, they're going to have tons of fixed points. I mean, at least in axis of fixed points, but that might have big subset. They might fit fix big convex subset of the building. And so the, the fixed point I was starting from can be very far away one from the other, but I can also find another fixed point that's fixed by, by, by all of them. Okay. And another property is that there are at most eight G minus 8 plus 3p, if I didn't mess up my comp computation yesterday, distinct growth rates among the sequences L of rho k of gamma. So if I take an element in my fundamental group, I can, see, can look at the translation length of the element under the various representations, and in total I'll have a bounded number of distant growth rates. Okay. And I guess that I'm... So I wanted to tell you something about the tools and the proof, but I guess I'm in, in one minute I'm not going to be able to say anything. So.